Another claim of a feathered dinosaur, this one from Canada. And that's it. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary analysis and commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy. Excellence in Pirate Broadcasting airing right across Canada on the Miracle Channel, all over the world via Roku on the Genesis Science Network, and of course on the Chris Jinnema Network on YouTube. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just head on over to genesisweek.com where you can find us, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. A recent report came out on a feathered dinosaur found here in Alberta, Canada. The dinosaur was found in the typical death pose with its head thrown back as far as it can go. Now, when I say the death pose is common, I ain't joking. It is so common it has its own name, the opisthotonic pose. It is powerful evidence that the dinosaurs died by drowning, and the sheer scale of the geology of the burial indicates a global flood. Now, back in 2007, Cynthia Fox and Kevin Padian published a paper on this very common death pose, in which they concluded that it was the creature itself pulling its head back due to asphyxiation, followed by rapid burial. The most obvious explanation would be a flood. In 2011, Alicia Cutler and team presented the results of their experiments at the Society Vertebrate Paleontology Conference. By placing dead chickens in cold water, they noted that the dead, dead chickens, would immediately pull their heads back into the typical death pose. Now, obviously, this pose would have to be held in place by rapid burial in order to preserve the fossils in the death pose position, as when the corpse rots, the muscles and ligaments let go and no longer hold the death pose. Now, the alleged feathers on dinosaurs are used doggedly to promote the alleged evolution of dinosaurs into birds. Now, I want to say up front, I have no problem with feathers on dinosaurs if that were actually found. Feathers on dinosaurs would not necessarily be de facto evidence that birds evolved from the dinosaurs. In essence, arguing that feathers are evidence that dinosaurs evolved into birds is an argument from homology or similarity. For instance, the bird wing, horse leg, whale flipper and human arm bone all have similar bone configurations, a homology. One could interpret this to mean they have all evolved from a common ancestor. One could also interpret this to mean that they had all been created by a common designer. My 1989 chick magnet had the same transmission as the General Lee. Why? Not because they had a common ancestor, but because they had a common designer. Dodge Motor Company. In like fashion, the creator can use similar designs and many people would spontaneously say they recognized the robots I built by my handiwork. There was a homology in action. They recognized the common designer, the common creator among all these different robots. This was because those robots had the same creator. So feathers on dinosaurs does not in any way refute creation, though it can be interpreted as support for dinosaurs evolving into birds. It could also be interpreted as evidence for creation, a common designer. My problem, however, is with what the evidence actually is and what the ev interpretation of that evidence is. Van der Riest and team used very strong language in their article. The most common integumentary structures are unambiguous feathers. However, distinct feathers are preserved along the dorsal vertebral series. However, feathers extend continuously to the eroded surface, indicating that the plumage on the flanks extended at least halfway to the belly. The left forelimb of TMP 2009 lies alongside the body and is also feathered, but the unguals are not visible because they are obscured by body plumage. 
feathers covering the left, left ilium are the best preserved on the entire specimen. Here, detail of feather preservation is excellent. In fact, they use the word feather 78 times in the paper. But let's take a look at the rest of one of the lines to see what they are calling feathers. The most common integumentary structures are unambiguous feathers comprising filaments that range from 25 to 87 millimeters in length and 0.2 to 0.5 millimeters in width, preserved as dark carbonaceous imprints surrounding specific portions of the skeleton. So what they actually found was fossil fuzz. They found filaments which they interpreted to be some kind of protofeather, an evolutionary precursor to the feather. In fact, their verbiage was remarkably like that of what was written about Sinusoropteryx when it was found with fossil fuzz claimed to be protofeathers back in 1998. Now, later on, it turned out those protofeathers were probably collagen fibers, which are a fiber found even in your skin. Now, interestingly, some scientists, both evolutionist and creationary scientists, criticized the original Sinusoropteryx paper and this paper for exactly the same thing. Big claims about feathers, but not providing any detailed close-up photos of these alleged feathers. Back in 2001, evolutionist Storrs Olson criticized the Dino de Bird advocate saying, they want to see feathers, so they see feathers. This is simply an exercise in wishful thinking. In fact, as Lingham, Solier, and team presented, the same kind of fossil fuzz was found on a fossil ichthyosaur, a marine reptile that looks an awful lot like a dolphin. Why don't we see a paper celebrating the feathered dolphin? Why do we not see a paper about how the ichthyosaur sported feathers and mentioned those feathers 78 times in the paper? I'll tell you why. Because it doesn't support the dinosaur to bird mythology touted as science. Further to that, such alleged fossil feathers were also found on ornithischian dinosaurs. Oh wait, what are ornithischian dinosaurs, you ask? Well, there are basically two groups of dinosaurs. The saurischians, which have hips like a lizard, hence the name saurischian, which means lizard-hipped. The ornithischians, meaning bird-hipped, are so named because they have hips like a bird. The saurischians include dinosaurs like T-Rex and the long necks, the sauropods. They lay eggs like a bird, some have feet like a bird, some have feet like elephants. They all have hips like a lizard. The ornithischians includes dinosaurs like the ceratopsians and the hadrosaurs. They lay eggs like a, a bird, some have multi-toed feet, but some have feet like a bird and some even sport a duck bill, hence the name duck-billed dinosaurs. In fact, one duck-billed dinosaur was found in Alberta back in 2013, which had what was described as a coxcomb the red, fleshy ornament on the rooster's head. A rooster is a bird. <laughs> and this duck-billed dinosaur, complete with a coxcomb, shares a lot of similarities to birds. All of the ornithischians have hips like a bird. Now, if you were an evolutionist speculating that dinosaurs evolved into birds, which group would you suggest the birds evolved from? The lizard-hipped dinosaurs or the bird-hipped dinosaurs? Well, the bird hip dinosaurs, of course, yet the current favored theory claims that the birds evolved from the saurischians, the lizard hipped dinosaurs. So as you can see, homology is a useless argument for evolutionary theories because the advocates are simply picking and choosing the homologies that they want. These alleged feathers have been found on both saurischians and ornithischians, and even on a marine reptile, the ichthyosaur. Now, this all leaves aside the very real problem of actually evolving feathers from scales, major and genetic, complicated genetic changes that are frankly impossible, genetically speaking. There have been a number of alleged dinosaurs found in China which do have clear, unambiguous feathers. However, evolutionists and creationists have pointed out how these creatures were immediately called dinosaurs when in fact they may simply be extinct flightless birds. But because of the evolutionarily assigned age of the rocks, the researchers expected to find dinosaurs, not birds. 
so they simply classified them as dinosaurs. Ashby Camp had an excellent article documenting this, which is freely available on the web at trueorigin.com. It also gets really interesting when you take the evolutionary timeline and the ages assigned to all of these alleged father dinosaurs. Now remember, the dinosaurs were supposed to be evolving into birds, and in particular evolving feathers from scales. It was claimed that all of the different stages of this feather evolution had been found. So in this chart, with the oldest on the left and your youngest on the right, we should see a gradual progression of scales to feathers. Instead, the alleged evolution is all over the map. Fossils with completely modern, complex feathers appear in the fossil record before the dinosaurs with protofeathers. So if anything, this fossil sequence is showing a de-evolution of the feather, with the animals becoming less and less bird-like. But it gets better. At the same time these researchers were publicizing feathers on a dinosaur in Alberta, other researchers were reporting on a completely modern flying bird buried with the dinosaurs. Goodness Cretaceous! What on earth is a modern bird doing flying over the heads of dinosaurs from which it was supposed to have evolved? In the paper, Nevalone and team used the word bird 40 times and used the word dinosaur once. And in that context, they were commenting how the alleged dinosaur ancestors of the birds had lost bird features found in this bird. So the evolution is again backwards. But wait, is this completely modern bird found flying over the heads of dinosaurs an unusual occurrence? Nope, not even close. When Dr. Carl Werner was conducting his research for his book and DVD, Living Fossils, he visited 60 natural history museums and 10 different dinosaur dig sites around the world. In asking the paleontologists, consistently they reported finding not just fossil birds, but modern fossil birds among the dinosaurs. Parrots, owls, albatross, loons, ducks, cormorants, penguins, sandpipers, the classic flamingo. Yet mysteriously, only one of the museums depicted a bird found with the dinosaurs, and they only depicted one bird off in an out-of-the-way corner. Why are they not displaying the evidence? You tell me, do you not think this is important fossil evidence? Yet how many natural history museums depict feathered dinosaurs and have displays devoted to the evolution of dinosaurs into birds? But it gets better. We find fossils before the dinosaurs in the evolutionary time scale. Proto-Avis is identical to the modern day blackbird, but yet it is deemed controversial. I would suggest the only reason it's controversial is because it was found in rocks dated 225 million evolutionary years old. Rocks in which I've personally excavated, the Texas Triassics. I've previously reported on the trail of fossil footprints at Blue Beach, Nova Scotia dated even older at some 350 million evolutionary years old, give or take a week. Well, before the evolutionary time of the dinosaurs, the tracks are a dead ringer match to the tracks of an ostrich, a completely modern bird with a very unique and recognizable foot. Yet not far from that trail, on the same beach, same rocks, famed early paleontologist and geologist William Dawson excavated a slab of rock in the early, early 1870s. Now, C. M. Sternberg revisited this slab in 1933 in a Geological Survey of America bulletin, Carboniferous Tracks from Nova Scotia. The slab had clear bird tracks on it. Note well what he writes about the tracks. Superficially, they resemble the tracks of some of the wading birds, but of course there is little probability of their having been made by birds. Why is there little probability of them being made by birds? Because of the evolution myth, there is no other reason. So you can see here that clear evidence of birds being around long before the dinosaurs is rejected out of hand. The birds didn't evolve from the dinosaurs, they've been around since the beginning of time, exactly like the Bible says. Well, the Bible has a lot to say, not just about the past, but also the future. If it's right about the past, I wonder what else it says about the future. I have had a pile of people asking about the status of the mystery Noah's Flood documentary, which has been renamed The Noah Flood, A World Change. 
Production is still progressing. In fact, co-producer Stephen Orsatti was just recently filming some of the last scenes involving actors, including the scenes with John the Baptist and Jesus getting baptized in the frigid waters of Minnesota in late October. Now, there's some diehard actors for you. Almost all the footage has been filmed, and we are now venturing into post-production, but frankly, we need your help to get this finished. If you recall, we never did make even a quarter of our budget during fundraising, and now this has left us stuck where we are still working at it, but in our off hours. Now, we believe, as do many of you, that this film will make a huge impact. Now, we have an investment opportunity for those who may be interested in helping to get a Christian film not just completed, but into theaters around the world. Now, to get details, send an email to Stephen with a ph at sixdaystudio.com. Wait, no, 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 get, get that out of there. The PH is supposed to be in the middle. The middle. There, that's better. Okay. Send an email to Stephen at sixdaysstudio.com or Ian at sixdaysstudio.com and ask for the information on the investors program. Once you have the info, you can decide for yourself if you want to invest in the film and how much. All right, we got to take a break back in one minute. Now in its second edition, Chronicles of Dinosauria is a beautiful coffee table reader that is sure to provoke fascinating discussions amongst all ages. Chronicles of Dinosauria takes the reader from creation to modern times from the perspective of the great reptiles and presents compelling evidence that dinosaurs and man lived together, just like the Bible says. In scrapbook style, author David Wetzel presents the biblical, historical, and fossil evidence with photos and beautiful drawings by artist Richard Dobbs. See evidence that humans are found in the fossil record right back to the time of the dinosaurs. The book culminates with fresh research into modern-day reports of dinosaurs living in remote areas like Papua New Guinea and the rainforests of Cameroon. You can get your own beautiful hardcover copy for only $16.99 plus shipping by going to genesispark.com or from any of the major online booksellers. in with today's topic at hand was a lengthy email I got over the summer from a gentleman who, for various reasons, wishes to remain anonymous. Now, he has made his identity known to me, so I don't mind respecting his wishes. While we may butt heads and sharply disagree, at least he doesn't hide behind the anonymity of the internet like so many of the skeptic cowards. There was just no possible way to include all that he wrote on the show, so uh, I apologize for having to edit it down to the most presently relevant comments. Uh, he refers to the BVCSM, which is the Big Valley Creation Science Museum, located in Big Valley, Alberta, and is Canada's first permanent creation museum. Mr. Anonymous had visited there and knew I was one of the four people who helped owner Harry Nyborg 
build the museum, and write the plaques. In fact, the plaquage is not even a word. <laughs> the plaquage is quite extensive about the equivalent of a medium-sized book. Mr. Anonymous wrote in, so, if I understand your position correctly, based on the presentation at the Big Valley Creation Science Museum, you believe that Deinonychus is a theropod, Cerishian dinosaur, while Archaeopteryx is a bird. Forgive me if I simply don't understand your argument, but you seem to be saying that the pelvis of birds like Archaeopteryx more closely resemble those of Ornithischian dinosaurs, like Parasaurolophus, than the Cerishians wildly believed to be among the closest relatives of birds such as Deinonychus. How so? A person can say anything is similar, more similar to anything else if they don't actually list characters. They could even call such assertions their interpretation and claim it to be as valid as anyone else's. But do you think most people would conclude, as you seem to have, that Archaeopteryx's pelvis is more like that of a Parasaurolophus than a Deinonychus? If I printed off photographs of all three pelvises and asked people on the street, I have a video camera and would be willing to do this experiment. If most people get the impression that Archaeopteryx's pelvis is more like that of Deinonychus than Parasaurolophus, then they might be forced to conclude that you are either blind, so uncritical of anti-evolution arguments that you didn't even bother to actually compare the pelvises, and simply constructed the arguments solely on the basis of the backwards naming of the dinosaur orders. Or they'll conclude that you did the comparison that you know it's not true, and that you are lying about it for some reason. Could this, and examples like this, be the reason why so many people are calling you a liar? This is not a minor point. This is absolutely fundamental to the coherency of the creationist position on birds and dinosaurs. Just what is the difference between dinosaurs and birds, believed to be most closely related, that makes it impossible that they could share common ancestry. I've been researching creationism for 10 years, yet every claimed feature diagnostic of birds is either absent in Archaeopteryx or present in Deinonychus. What aspects of their fossil anatomy rules out the possibility that all the paravians are varieties of the same kind of animal and thus share common ancestry? Please understand I'm not calling you a liar. I'm just genuinely baffled as to how you've reached the conclusions that you have, and I'm offering my perspective on why I think so many people have decided that you must be deliberately dishonest and publicly accuse you of such. I really want to understand your views on what distinguishes birds from dinosaurs and what rules out common ancestry between Archaeopteryx and any Dromaeosaurid or Truodontid. Because when I look online at creationist classification schemes for dinosaurs and birds, including yours, it honestly doesn't make a lick of sense to me and my paleo friends all seem to have come to similar conclusions for similar reasons. I walk by dinosaur and bird pelvises every day and I don't see what you seem to be seeing. Thanks for writing in. Now, I never made public statements on the comparisons of Archaeopteryx hips, frankly, and there was reasons for this. Namely, it was irrelevant. <laughs> the evolutionist camp doesn't know how relevant Archaeopteryx is. Uh, if you're going to argue that birds evolved from dinosaurs, why are you arguing that they evolved from the Saurischians? Because of Archaeopteryx? One particular specimen upon which you evolutionists cannot even agree upon interpretation. May I remind you that Kevin Padian detailed in his Dinosauria book some 10 or more reasons why Archaeopteryx was a bird. Some evolutionists have suggested Archaeopteryx is a de-evolved bird. That is, it evolved from an already flying bird, and Archaeopteryx lost its ability to fly. So if that were true, that means the flying birds were around even before Archaeopteryx, and long before the dinosaurs. Are you then building your evolution of flying birds using Archaeopteryx as a cornerstone, a creature that apparently lost its ability to fly? Now, with all the topsy-turvy use of the data, <laughs> you then turn around and say that what I'm saying doesn't make a lick of sense? Dude, come on! <laughs> now, regarding dinosaur hips, the only point that the BBCSM team and I were making was that if you're going to use homology as an argument, 
Use it all. It has nothing to do with an attempt to rule out common ancestry. It is pointing out your cherry-picked homology arguments. Do you walk by hadrosaurs, ducks, and the duck-billed platypus every day? Why not say they are related? They all have duck bills. If you feel that that is a weak argument, then you have precisely understood my point about how weak the homological argument is. Did you notice how the authors of this most recent paper of the Cretaceous bird never once mentioned Archaeopteryx? Why not? I have given only some of the reasons they didn't. They are well aware of the confusion and controversy that Archaeopteryx presents to the models of Dino to bird evolution. They left Archaeopteryx out of the discussion because Archaeopteryx is of no help to the theories of dinosaur to bird evolution. All right, I'm out of time. I'm your host, Ian Jimmy. Thank you for watching the show, all three of you. And I hope you'll join me again next Genesis week. Remember, you can send us your questions, comments, heat mail, and random Christmas gifts to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com, or you can send us a tweet at genesisweek, or you can head on over to genesisweek.com, find the most recent show, and leave a comment there. Or visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash genesisweektv. Remember those words of warning and comfort from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org slash donations, and thank you for your support. Thank you.